Hello and welcome to The Game Changers, the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport, knocking down barriers and challenging the status quo for women and girls everywhere. I'm Sue Anstis, a founding trustee of the Women's Sport Trust charity and the founder of Fearless Women, a company with a powerful ambition to drive positive change for women's sport. I'm incredibly grateful to Sport England for supporting this series of The Game Changers. Sport England have done so much to tackle the inequalities women face across all areas of sport, from the much celebrated This Girl Can campaign and initiatives that help shape school sport for girls, to schemes that encourage more female volunteers in the workforce, support female coaches and officials, and ensure more women from all backgrounds take leadership positions on the boards of our sports organisations. As women's rugby continues to grow at an incredible rate, I am thrilled to say that my guest today is Katie Salier, General Manager of Women's Rugby at World Rugby. A former elite athlete herself, Katie led the transformation of New Zealand's high-performance sports system and in 2016 received a Lifetime Achievement Award for her contribution to sport in New Zealand over the past 25 years. I'd heard Katie refer to herself as a child of the Commonwealth, so I asked her to explain what she meant by that. I was born in Scotland. My father is from, was from Perth, Western Australia, and my mother was from Glasgow. So yes, I lived in Aberdeen until I was two and then moved from Scotland to Vancouver, uh, where my dad was a university lecturer and my mother was a nurse. And I was there in Canada until I was 15. And then at 15, I went down to New Zealand and I've lived in New Zealand all the way through until I took up this job at World Rugby in 2017. But it's a little bit more complicated in that my grandfather, who lived in Australia, was born in South Africa, so South African heritage. And my great-great-grandfather came from Tipperary in Ireland. So when I went to the World Cup in Japan uh, for rugby for the Men's World Cup last year, I kind of had six countries covered. <laughs> One of them was going to win, and clearly the South Africans did. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And what were your earliest memories of sport as a girl growing up in Vancouver? Um, well, I was very involved in aquatic sports in, in Vancouver. I sort of started out as a competitive swimmer, and then at quite a young age, I started, uh, I got involved in synchronized swimming. It was kind of, you know, when you're involved in, in swimming and aquatic sports, really high time demanding. Um, so, you know, by the time I was 13, I was doing sort of 35 hours a week of training. So it became, it became more than a sport. It became almost like an occupation, but I loved it. And, you know, obviously Canada is a, a, a country or well, like all the countries that I've lived in, that is a very active nation. So there was lots of um, women role models around uh, in terms of both in the aquatic world, but also in, in sport full stop. And how did you discover synchronized swimming? You did it with your sister, I believe, as well. Yeah, I did. I, I, you know, I was kind of one of those. I was, I was kind of in that in between of a sporty girl and an arty girl because I also did dance as well. I did ballet till I was on point, and I did a lot of drama and singing and the whole kind of um, musical theater stuff. And I, maybe that was the link with synchronized swimming. But I, but I started off. I mean, you know, I mean, my parents really believed that everyone should swim. So you know, I have a younger brother and an older sister. We were definitely in the pool for a lot of our, our younger lives. Uh, and then my sister started, first of all, she got involved in synchronized swimming. And I, I used to think this doesn't seem to be very fair. I was being left behind with my dad and my brother and my sister was taking off around Canada, competing in, in different competitions. So I joined actually following her. She wasn't my duet partner when I was in Canada. Um, I was kind of part of a, a kind of a wider team that she was a member of. But when I moved to New Zealand and she followed, we ended up competing for New Zealand at the Olympics in 1984. And people can be a little judgy, I think, about synchro in terms of the smiles and the costumes and so on. But it's a tough old sport, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny, like in the 84 Olympics, I think there was a research study that was done looking at athletes and who were the phys most physically fit all round. And if you think about a sport like synchro, so you had to have the flexibility and um, of a gymnast in terms of, you know, you know, being not having the kind of weight bearing ability to do splits on upside down, you had to be as fit, if not more than a, as a competitive swimmer, because you did all the competitive training. Uh, uh, and then, and then you had to hold your breath at the same time. I mean, I was never really into the, 
into the smiley sequins bit of the sport. Uh, it was just a bit too painful for me. Uh, but I, I really enjoyed the whole kind of physical fitness aspect of it and, and the entertainment aspect. And you mentioned moving to New Zealand. So was that tough to be uprooted as a teenager? Yeah, I, I, it was my last year of high school. But I was always a kind of a, you know, with having parents and family that were all around the world, you were always, a you know, a bit of an adventurist. I mean, I always talk about this job that I'm in now as my big girl's adventure. Um, so from that perspective, I, I liked to go different places. And I always sort of knew that, you know, if I didn't like it, I could I could come back. My sister didn't come to New Zealand initially. She stayed and she was she moved to Calgary and, and swam for another year. So didn't come down for another couple of years. So I went down with my parents and then I did decide, I thought, oh my gosh, my friends were so important back then. I did go back and I did my first year of university at UBC in, in Vancouver and played water polo. And that's when I picked up the love of water polo and played water polo across Canada and down, you know, kind of the can the Canadian American side. And then I played it when I got back to New Zealand as well. But after being away for a year, I, I you know, I kind of realized that particularly I think it was at Christmas time that home is where your mom and dad are. So I did move back down to New Zealand and my sister followed. And so then we, then we continued on with our sporting career down there. And how easy was it to find a new club and a synchronized coach there? Cause you went to a very high level then. Yeah, it was not that easy because it wasn't a very big sport in, in New Zealand at all. Um, you know, swimming has, has had a huge track record in New Zealand, but synchronized swimming, there was kind of small fledgling groups. So you ended up being, the administrator, the competitor, self-coaching, sometimes judging. Uh, so I, I guess one of the things that, that I did early on was try and grow the sport in the country. And that kind of led to me making sport, a best, I guess, a bit of a career in, in that I got involved in administration as soon as I finished competing really, really young. I was on the board in, in, in New Zealand and it's the same in Ireland and probably in the UK as well. You have an aquatic federation that looks after all the aquatic disciplines. So water polo, synchronized swimming, diving, master swimming, open water swimming and competitive swimming. So at a very, very young age, I was on the board of New Zealand Swimming. Um, and it's quite ironic. I, I, you know, as of two months ago, I, I accepted a position as a director on Swim Ireland. It was kind of my first board at 20. 23, 24, and, and I'm 55, so I'm back on the board of swimming. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, I love that. And just to take you a little bit back, I guess, into your time of competing, so when did you realise that you had that talent to compete at a, a world stage, do you think? Um, I, I think that um, synchronised swimming in Canada at the time, you know, when I was kind of 14 and 15, they, it was definitely one of the, the top Olympic sports for the country. So, you know, they were always in the top three, if not, the, you know, it was, it was rivalry between the Americans, the Canadians and the Japanese back then for the top three medal potential. And at, at, before I left and went to New Zealand, Canada didn't have a centralized program. They basically picked club teams that did well at the national championships to represent themselves. So I'd actually represented Canada the year before I moved to New Zealand. I was chosen in a team that came and swam in two or three competitions in Switzerland and in Belgium. That really gave me a bit of a taste to international sport. Uh, I mean, it was great. You know, it's a team sport. So synchronized swimming at that stage, I was really much more into the eight eight girls in the water kind of exercise as opposed to doing it only on your own or with a duet partner. Um, and I, I kind of sort of saw, you know, I, I had a summer of um, spending time in swimming pools around Europe and competing in some really interesting competitions and doing quite well. And I sort of thought, well, you know what, I think this is something that I should keep going at. So when I moved to New Zealand, I just kept going. And, and I guess I was a bit novel because like the program wasn't really, really big there, but quickly, you know, with comp competitions and spending quite a bit of time in Australia, I realized that, you know, that we could do quite well. So I ended up getting a, a medal at the Commonwealth Games in, in 1986 in in, um, in Scotland, which was was pretty cool, and and didn't do too badly at the Worlds and at the Olympic Games as well. I love the way you just like, yeah, just the medal at the Commonwealth Games. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned there that you obviously were on the board of um, Aquatics New Zealand. Yeah, Swim New Zealand. It was called Swim New Zealand. Mm -hmm. Yes. And what was the makeup of the board when you, you came onto it at the time? Uh, there was me and I guess when I'm just thinking of all the different aquatic disciplines and seven men. <laughs> so, and I was young. You know, it's kind of funny, like people sort of ha have asked me that question, you know, what was like being the only woman on a, on a board at a really young age, a really young age? 
I was so much younger than, than the rest of the people on the board. So yes, I was a young female, but I was also young in terms of um, the life experiences of some of the people that were on that board. So that was kind of interesting, but I had a different background. And I, and I think that, you know, swimming is, is a, a very traditional sport and it still is in, in many ways in terms of officialdom. And it can be quite strict. It can be, it has quite a lot of culture associated with what you can and you cannot do in that aquatic world. So I was kind of a bit of a rebel, I have to say, sort of coming into a, a board at a young age um, where I, I was kind of um, far more casual in my approach to senior administration. And I, I remember I gave the guys a bit of a hard time and they put out with me because I, maybe I was a little bit unique in that they would we would turn up at meetings in Wellington and in, in boardrooms at Swimming New Zealand offices. And, and there would be literally would be no windows or anything like that. It was a Sunday afternoon. You were really there by yourself and they would all kind of march up there in their blazers and their their suits and their pins and their ties. And I would kind of rock up there in my track suit. <laughs> a, there wasn't a suit and a tie for me at that stage. I mean, you know, I'm 55, so we're talking back a few haircuts. But also I just couldn't see the point, you know, <laughs> to sit to sit. And so so that whole kind of tradition, although you respect that, and I, I know for some people that that type of thing is, is really important in terms of official, officialdom. But to me, it was really, I could imagine that if you weren't very confident, you could find that whole kind of thing rather intimidating in terms of walking into a room with a bunch of um, reasonably elderly men in suits. Is there anything you would do differently if you know what you know now going back to that time? I think that probably, and it's even not so much back that time, it's, it's, it's when I've reflected very much on my career. You know, I'm in this role now where my title is General Manager of Women's Rugby for World Rugby. And it's the first time, although I am a woman and I've worked in sport for years and years and years and years, it's the first time I've had a title called Women's Sport Person. And, you know, I think in hindsight, when I look at my career, it, particularly in that early age, you were just going for it. You just you just went ahead and you did everything you could. And perhaps I could have done more to bring more women with me at an early earlier stage. I didn't really think of myself as I am a woman in an administration position and that I should do more to bring create more roles for more women. I was just really flying by the seat of my pants, trying to trying to be as professional and um, get things. You know, I've always been someone who works at pace, so it was very much about moving as quickly as possible to cementing the next stage for the future for the sport. But I wasn't really thinking so much about gender back then. And, and now in hindsight, probably I would. And, and when I look at the work that I do now with women around the world and some of the barriers uh, for them and the challenges for them and the opportunities that, that perhaps in hindsight, if I had, if I had the wisdom I have now as a 24 year old, I might have done some things differently. We all might be doing different things, aren't we? You led the uh, establishment of the New Zealand Academy of Sport in the late 90s and helped take a country with a population of just 4 million from four Olympic medals at Sydney to 18 at Rio. So what do you feel changed about sport in New Zealand while you were in that role? Well, that was one of the most amazing opportunities. And if you think about your career and you think of some of the really good projects that you've been involved in, that was quite a big project. I mean, I, I guess that basically what happened was Sydney had been awarded the Olympic Games. And, and back then, we didn't, we didn't really have a high performance system. We had kind of a grant program where athletes who had talent were given sort of individual grants. But there wasn't sort of like a systematic way of developing talent in the country. So Sydney got the Olympics. The prime minister set up a task force to capitalize on the Sydney Olympics, which was made up of business and sport and I was given the task of being the secretariat for that to start to drive. How did we actually turn that into our home games for us, for a country that was never going to host an Olympic Games? After that piece of work, we were, which I was looking at the economic development aspects and, and how we could actually commercialize, become a host city venue, we realized that we needed to do something on field. And I was, um, you know, I had been an, a, uh, an elite athlete and I was just in the right place where the government said, we need someone to have a look at what good practices around the world. And I was given this, this task of visiting high performance systems right around the globe, ones that we felt that we could compete with, others that we really just were interested in seeing how they had fast tracked their system to come back and create something that was, was not copying but was cognizant of good practice and created something that was quite unique for New Zealand. So I came back, I wrote a report. I, I 
brought the sports sector with me in terms of understanding that if we really, really felt that we wanted to play with the big the big countries and and sport was so much part of our culture in New Zealand, that we had to change, dramatically change and work differently. Because because I also sort of knew, you know, the reports have said we can't compete on dollars um, and in terms of the investment. And we certainly couldn't compete on numbers. We were a small nation. So we had to think differently and we had to sort of capitalize on on things that we could do, like being quick and nimble and be able to respond and adjust quickly to opportunities and situations. And we needed to quickly adapt to where was good practice and how could we utilize that. And the country that that I guess that we learned most from and that that I brought into the system when I came back was Norway. You know, I spent quite a bit of time in, in Oslo having a look at their Olympic training center and seeing how um, a country of that size, similar, um, could do so well, particularly at the Winter Olympics, but also in, in some significant major um, sports. So came back with a bit of a vision, um, an unwritten vision to be the Norway of the Southern Hemisphere and see how we could really turn this around. You know, we ha- we always had our big big brother, big sister next to us, Australia, and the Australian Institute of Sport was just pumping out medals. Uh, so we we kind of adopted, well, we didn't kind of adopt it. We, we did, did, did two or three things. First of all, we became very, very targeted. We worked out who, you know, what were the sports that we could really excel in and unashamedly went through a targeting exercise saying that we could not, we couldn't be world champions in everything. We needed to pick a, a small group of sports and really, really focus on making them world-class. And when they became world-class, then the business case would expand to actually increasing more money into other sports. So that was part of it. And we picked eight to start with. And the next part of it was, what do you wrap around? What's the kind of infrastructure that you need in terms of support for those programs uh, in terms of creating proper daily training environments and proper applied services to really take it that next level. So it sort of did two things, you know, brought in expertise from outside and created a, a structure that the sports could flourish in and then really honed in on the sports that we would do. And then the one other thing, you know, it is, is which I really learned from Norway is, and I think it's still quite unique in New Zealand. And that I, although, you know, I mean, I worked in high performance sport for a long period of time and, and things have adjusted, but we really, we picked up the concept of Norway that we needed to be one team you know, that we could not afford to not capitalize on the knowledge that existed in all our sports and work together as one team. And so when you think about the New Zealand high performance system now, you know, we develop our coaches as as together in terms of joint professional development, our performance directors in terms of joint professional development. We share constantly in terms of knowledge transfer in our pre-briefs and our debriefs and where we're traveling and not traveling. So it is much, it is, it is definitely a one team culture as opposed to a whole bunch of sports doing their own thing. There's been a lot in the media recently about how the ambition of medals has negatively impacted the well-being of athletes. I'm thinking, especially in sports like gymnastics and swimming and athletics. Does that surprise you to see that recently? Well, I, th- I think some of the stories that have come out um, recently in terms of, you know, particularly in the gymnastics and looking at the the athlete A, which I'm sure everyone has had a look at, are, are just horrific. Um, does it surprise me? I mean, you know, people are driven by certain things and certain nations are driven more by um, certain things. When I think of New Zealand, we definitely um, are a country that puts a balanced approach to performance and participation. And and that has always been really, really important. Uh, You know, although I was an elite athlete, I had a daughter that participated in lots of different sports and participation and active recreation is very much a part of the New Zealand culture. And so whilst we do have a, a, a pointy end in terms of high performance, there is a huge investment in participation and getting getting people just active. And, and I think that that is as important as the high end and hopefully the two can mutually drive each other. So it's not about performance for performance sake only. It's about performance because it drives things that are about social change in, in, in countries growing participation, growing national pride, creating that social cohesion, and which is why it's so important right now. And if you think about the countries around the world, and most of them have done this now, where the government, you know, New Zealand government's done that, and Ireland here has done it, I know in the UK, where they've got pretty significant packages about getting sport back up and moving as quickly as important, because because sport in a crisis can be the most important and the least important thing, obviously sit in the most important thing. Uh, you talk about the pointy edge of sport. Do you feel that having more female coaches at that pointy end 
might perhaps have prevented or changed a lot of those issues that we're seeing now in terms of the negative side of sport? Um, well, there's a lot of women gymnastics coaches. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, I'll be honest and sort of say I don't know, but I do know that we have to do more for women. We need to have more women role models and leaders in both coaching and non-coaching positions. And it has certainly been something that we have been focusing on significantly in terms of world rugby, working very, very closely with um, a wonderful woman from the UK called Carol Isherwood, who's one of our hey. world, rugby, world rugby Hall of Famers. And she has been working very closely with us to drive a huge transformation in terms of getting more women involved in high performance coaching. But we also need to be quite careful that, you know, that some of the data and the stuff that talks about women coaches talk about, particularly at a club and a junior level, talk about that one of the reasons that they're really good is because they have that kind of mothering instinct. That's not what we're about right now. They're also great coaches. And so, you, you know, capitalizing and creating opportunities for um, women who are exceptional leaders in coaching perspective um, will drive a different group of, of more women coming through into coaching. So we will see some changes. You were awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award from Sport New Zealand in 2016, I believe. Was there a part of you at the time that thought you might then take a different career path in terms of sports? Yeah, well, I actually had. I mean, it was kind of one of those bizarre events. I mean, I I worked in sport for a very, very long time. Well, I'm still working in sport. It's kind of funny. But I, I I went through a variety of organizations, sort of starting off with the Hillary Commission, named after Sir Edmund Hillary, where I was kind of more into the volunteer sport, national government body, capability, improvement, um, grassroots stuff. Then I went to work for the Sports Foundation, which was kind of that, that organization that just picked up grants. Then they created this new organization called um, SPARC, Sport and Recreation New Zealand. And then I worked for Sport New Zealand and High Performance Sport New Zealand. So five different kind of crown entities along a, a kind of pathway. But got to the age of 40 and thought, oh my gosh, I need to apply for a job. And I sat and I, I talked to a, a bunch of people that were on boards that I had reported to, to get some feedback about who I was and what I was and what they saw the strengths were. And they all advised me, I needed to step out and do some really big jobs in other sectors for a period of time and then step back in if I, if I wanted to. And so that's what I did. So at the time when, when I, when I won that award, I was not working in sport. I was doing some things that were completely different, which were definitely stretching me from a, from a challenge perspective. And I was invited back for this dinner where I um, I just thought I was going along to another sports dinner oh, wow. and, and then all of a sudden there, one of my mentors was practically reading my eulogy and I thought, oh my gosh, this is me they're talking about. And I, I was only 50 at the time and I, and I kind of thought, wow, who gets this at this age? This is kind of bizarre. And it did make me think when I was listening to the things that, that I'd had the privilege of being associated with during my, my sporting career that I would love to get back into that, and which is why that's kind of springboarded into me into this current role. And why did you take this role at World Rugby? Well, I mean, literally, I went I went home from this dinner and I was just re reflecting on all these people giving me hugs and, and handshakes and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, you, one of those very special moments. And it just it made me realize that I wasn't finished. I love sport. I love the, the power of sport to change people's lives. And one of the things that I hadn't been able to do as much of was to use sport as a social change agent. So I kind of in my mind thought that at some stage, I'd love to be working in an international organization that did use sport for sport development. And literally two weeks after the awards, I thought, I've got to look out for things. And this job came up and, and it came across my desk and someone said, you should put your name in the hat for that. And I went and I spoke to one of my very close friends who was the chief executive of New Zealand rugby at the time, Steve Chu. And I said, what do you reckon? He wasn't really encouraging me to take this role. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a big thing at 50, moving to the other side of the world. But, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I was looking at what was going on. It was a very long, robust recruitment process, but I just saw the potential. And I saw some of the things that were happening around the globe in terms of women's rugby. And, yet, yet, you know, it is such a powerful, empowering sport for women. And I, you know, I just thought, look, if I can get this job, I want this job. And I really, really, really believe that I could do some really good things. And it was a new role. 
total new York, new role. There was a there was a wonderful woman who's actually on Rugby's World Rugby Council right now called Sue Carty. She was a development manager uh, working at World Rugby, and she had left. She'd been gone for about twelve months before they advertised this role. And I think that that World Rugby turned around and realized it, it had been such a success at the Olympics in in Rio, and the numbers were growing. Uh, you know, so, I mean, I know most, I mean, I spend a lot of time with other international federations or my, my equivalent organi- people in international organizations. And we all say we're the fastest growing women <laughs> before, but we were very fast and are, you know, 20%, 28% increase in, in numbers year on year. And in, in countries that you just wouldn't expect would be involved in, in such a physically demanding sport because of some of the challenges that exist there for women. So, yes, I thought, um, uh, they created this position. Uh, it was quite unique. Uh, I've kind of gone about it a little bit differently than some of my colleagues in, in terms of uh, the approach to change and transformation. But we're we're really making a difference, and and I and I'm really excited about um, what's happened so far. And I want to come on to talk to you about activity on the ground. But just talking governance initially, mm-hmm. when you joined, is it true that people told you there was no way at the time that World Rugby would have women on its council? <laughs> I've heard. Oh yeah, oh there was. You know, I remember there was an article that was written by um, a very famous American coach, uh, coaching women's rugby, and I think she had just done a report to Rugby Americas North. We've got six regional associations, and I was reading this, and I and basically, she was making a comment about how we would never see the change, and I had. You know, I've never played rugby. So, you know, I come from New Zealand. I was married to a a halfback who played in Wellington um, a long time ago. Uh, So I knew a lot about rugby and I had a lot of friends that were associated with the New Zealand Rugby Union and I came from New Zealand. So it's part of it's part of what you do down there. But coming to an organization that had 27 percent of its population were women playing around the world and we were governed by a board of 30 men you know you do you do sit there and think hmm okay there's some big changes that have to be made around here but full credit I know that's kind of a rugby saying full credit to what I call my ambassadors that that are all around the globe now they kind of realize that you know you, you can't say that you want to be world leading in sport and not be committed to international best practice and so one of the things that needed to be changed and needs to continuously be changed, and we're still on a transformation. You know, I think over the next six months, you'll see some even better changes that are going to come out of world rugby. But we needed to do something significant and impactful really early on if we were going to drive the transformation that needed to happen around the globe. You know, my first year was about developing a global plan, listening to people around the world to work out what were the key drivers that we needed to put in place to to accelerate the global development of women in rugby, to create women's rugby and girls' rugby be normal. And one of the big, big pillars of that was leadership change. And on the day that they signed off on the the eight-year strategy, we changed the the governance structure of world rugby and brought on 17 women directors. So from zero to 36%, just like that. And so when people say things like that can't happen, they certainly can happen. And we're doing the same in coaching. You know, I, I I think that we did quite a big piece of work just to kind of understand what was going on in coaching, because in that leadership work stream, it's not just about administrators and, and senior managers. It also must be coaching. And we realized that we were so far behind the eight ball in terms of, you know, I think we did a review of the top 16 um, women's sevens and 15 teams. There was only one country in the world back in 2017 that had a woman as a head coach. And there was only four countries that had women involved in coaching teams. Um, so we knew we needed to do some dramatic change. And we, we kind of signed off on a, a really holistic suite of recommendations, um, which we are implementing with Vim and Vigor, which are about changing the look and feel of coaching, not just having women coaching women. It's about having diversity in coaching teams. So there's been some, you know, we're about to announce something that's really quite big in terms of deployment opportunities for women coaches globally. uh, But we are absolutely driving a change on the field as well. Excellent. That's fantastic to hear. And I guess on a slightly more negative point, I think it was Ali Dunley that pointed out there were more Bretts than women on the 12-strong board of World Rugby this year for the second successive term. So does that, clearly, that does frustrate you then when you see so much good work happening elsewhere in terms of governance? Yes, but, and I, I put that with a big but, that was a catalyst for change. And, you know, this isn't, it's not an overnight thing, although the first first was overnight. You know, one of the, the big things that, that came out of this election was a strong commitment by the current chairman to relook at the governance structure of world rugby. And so, yes, 
our first change was bring on 17 women onto council. And that is the highest decision-making body. You know, EXCO is a subset of that. So that is the, the biggest decision-making. And then the next thing was, you know, once every four years, which is now the election, we need to look at repopulating all our subcommittees to make sure that they reflect gender balance and a diversity inclusion. So that's happening now. And then on top of that, the commitment that Bill made at that time, I mean, he was he was one of the first people to say that's not good enough, was that we are currently doing a, a governance review, which will take place, which has commenced, and it will take place uh, over the next three to four months. And diversity and inclusion on all committees and EXCO is a key component of that. So you will see some changes. Watch so this space. Watch this space. And that will be that'll be this year. So like I think there's um there's some really big announcements that are coming up in, in rugby uh this year. We know that next year is is incredibly big for us with you know I I've, I I talk quite often about I think that we're probably the only sport that's got an Olympic Games and a World Cup for women in the same year. Very, very unique. And we are going to capitalize on that to the max. But we are rapidly trying to knock off those those issues that are are still irritating for for a lot of people, men and women, in terms of creating good practice on boards. That's good news. Going back then to the piece you talked about being so passionate about in terms of sport for social change, why do you feel that rugby is so powerful in terms of changing lives for women and girls? Clearly. I know that you're a passionate rugby follower. <laughs> I've, 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 I've come across you at several of the events. It's it's such there's a, there's a, there's so many things about this the sport. Firstly, the values of of rugby. Um, you know, we talk about it being a sport that builds character as kind of a subline, and that's really really true. I mean, you think about the team aspect of of rugby and and the whole kind of all shapes and sizes, the way that it embraces uh, all different cultures and and how strong we are when it comes to stamping out things that don't fit and that are not aligned to those kind of values. So that's kind of really important. The physical nature of it, the presence of some of these women, and you don't have to be large to have that strong presence. You know, when I watch some of the teams in the, in Malaysia or in India, and, you know, we're talking about some pretty small girls, but the, uh, you know, in, in, in New Zealand, we would talk about it being their mana, their, their, the way that they have that kind of self belief and control uh, is is just incredibly impressive. You know, when we launched the plan in 2017, uh, I went and we launched it in Dubai at the under-17 Asia girls uh, sevens tournament. And I think there was 16 countries from around Asia, incredibly colorful gear that they were wearing, you know, in the in the full hijab um, outfits in multicolors. And I was watching these girls from, you know, places like, you know, Pakistan and, and um, Vietnam and Laos and, and, and you look at them and and you you realize that what you're developing here is incredibly powerfully strong women with with great support networks within their country and globally. I mean, you're part of a global family when you when you play rugby. You know, we we ran a we launched a campaign last year, which we're just about we're starting phase two up right now called Try and Stop Us, Start Rugby, Become Unstoppable. And it was, you know, particularly picked out some of the the places where we, we know that women have challenges and uh, and used a uh, woman who had excelled through rugby um, to become inspirational role models that are driving significant social change in those countries. I mean, Nahid, who's one of the one of the the women in our Unstoppable campaign, she's the, the coach development manager from Iran. You know, and Iran went from three and a half thousand women participating in um, rugby pre our Try and Stop Us campaign to well over ten thousand in just that period of time, and. You know, it is just fantastic when, when I look at the photos that get sent from countries like Iran or from Pakistan or from Syria or from Uganda, and you look at these women playing and and you know how physically challenging it is. It just makes you able to stand up for anything on the field and off the field. Is that the bit that excites you most? It sounds like it is in terms of the changing lives through the sport. Absolutely. I mean, I, I am very fortunate in that I have my background is high performance and I, you know, I can say I've been to nine Olympic and Commonwealth Games and so many world championships and you get a buzz out of sort of sitting there, particularly when your country's doing really well. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I always remember being in Athens at the Olympics with the minister and being at the end of the triathlon and we got gold and silver in the men's event. I mean, that was just like blow your mind away. Those are really exciting moments. And they're fun and they create inspiration for others. But I think what I have really got a an amazing gratification from in this job 
has been how appreciative the women around the world have been. We've invested heavily in leadership. And I know that, you know, you invest in a, le in a leader, then that woman changes the lives of others. And then that woman changes the lives of others. And then that woman changes the lives of others. And so if I can do more to support women who have potential and want to lead, then, you know, that that is just such a gift. And, you know, you don't get jobs like this very often to be in that kind of privileged. And I, you know, and sometimes as with all sports jobs, you can, you can come home and you can think about the politics. You think, oh, how am I going to get that over the line? And then whenever that happens, I seem to get a text from someone, one of these wonderful women that I've, you know, maybe just done something very simple for her. And they just say such wonderful things to you. I mean, it does wonderful things for your ego, but you just know <laughs> that it's, that it's so sincere that their lives are different and that they are doing different things because you've been able to convince others to create opportunities for them. And wow, that's incredibly powerful. You mentioned the Try and Stop Us campaign, which I loved. What is the next phase? Or can you give us a sort of hint of what's coming? Yeah, it's, it was a three-year um, campaign. So what we've rolled out now, so it was, was started off globally where we identified um, to try and make sure that we, rep we, we had a group of, of 15 unstoppables that represented the world in terms of diversity and inclusion and shapes and sizes and roles and, and amazing stories. Um, we've now moved into a, um, working with unions and regions to identify their own unstoppables. So what we've done is we've created a series of, of online assets where, where unions can identify their own team and do their own social media and have their own local heroes. And that will roll out all the way through ongoing because it actually helps, particularly in, although it's been great, some of the major unions are, are really on board with it as well. But what we were trying to do was to create marketing opportunities for unions that didn't have access to that, to, to use that kind of campaign to drive participation, profile and investment. And the next phase, which is something that we're working on on now, which will launch in, in 2021, is, is looking at that special year called, you know, the golden year of, of women's rugby with the, the Olympics and the World Cup. How we then go and um, link the unstoppables, probably at a younger age, through to connecting the world to the World Cup in New Zealand and then taking the World Cup back to the world. So it'll be kind of a, a mixture of, of, um, of huge, impressive uh, events that will take place linked to really cool young girls around the world that are doing some pretty amazing things so yeah watch the space it's gonna be exciting very exciting you made some very disruptive decisions about branding major championships last year can you tell us a little bit about that yeah um you know I, I ultimately we have a women's advisory committee uh that reports into the rugby committee at world rugby and it's um it's a really great committee you know that's one of the things that we, we, we get assessed by the ioc on an annual basis every if does in terms of its commitment to gender, the gender equity objectives of the IOC. And our Women's Advisory Committee is 50% um, is men, 50% women. And it has been chaired for the last period of time by two really impressive men. First, it was the Chief Executive of Australian Rugby, um, Bill Pulver, and he had um, some really big things he wanted to drive in terms of gender change and, and diversity on boards with, with um, Sir Bill Beaumont. And now I'm working with uh, a very passionate, the Vice President of France, Serge Simon, who is really into um, driving profile competition kind of changes. So, but ultimately one of the key themes that we're trying to do in terms of what the change state is, is to normalize women's involvement in rugby. And so that when you think of it as a sport, it's just automatically, it's just, just it's not a sport that's played by men and all. Oh, yeah. Do sometimes women play that as well. It's just, it, it, you know, get to the stage where it's like an aquatics or a cycling and you just think about it and it's just a sport. So there was things that we needed to do along the, the way. One was to change the look and feel of the of the game and how we actually portray it. So we've spent quite a bit of time looking at our social media channels, how, you know, the kind of things that we pump out. Are they resources that are full of boys or are they reflective of the fact that it's a, it's a gender neutral? So we've, we've done a lot of work on content in terms of getting more woman profiles and woman stories across the thing. But the same thing needed to happen about the competitions is that, you know, we, we came to the conclusion, we sort of saw what, what cricket, cricket had done initially. I mean, cricket turned around at their last cycle of world championships where they decided that they would add men's into their World Cup title. So they've got a, a women's cricket World Cup and they have a men's cricket World Cup. And we looked at that and we sort of said that, you know, rightly or wrongly, there was probably a perception that um, the men's World Cup is the most important 
uh, in terms of our, um, our pinnacle events and the Women's um, World Cup was second. And, and one of the reasons people would think that, I mean, wait, we recognize in terms of generating economic return for the game right now and for the foreseeable future, although we're trying to do something different in the commercial space, the women's game is absolutely reliant on the, on the men's game, but the men's game is reliant on the women's game for other things as well. So we know that that is a huge driver of economic value. But when you think about the event itself and the players that participate and aim for World Cup glory, that there should be no difference. So what we did is we dropped the gender from our tournaments. So we now have got three World Cups. We've got one that's played by men, one that's played by women, and one that's played by men and women. That's the sevens. And then we have the Olympic Games, which is played by men and women. We don't have a World Cup and a Women's World Cup. Now, I know that, that, you know, that some people might think that that's semantics, but it was something that we consulted with our sponsors about. And we, um, we felt very strongly that that was about leveling the, the field in terms of not having uh, one event more important than the other in terms of how we portray them. So they are both pinnacle events and they are equal in terms of what we're trying to achieve from a player development perspective. So talking then about the World Cup in New Zealand next year, can you tell us a little bit about what will be different there, perhaps, than ones that have gone before? Um, Well, every time, um, you know, as with most international federations and national federations, every time you run a pinnacle event, you do quite a significant debrief. And and that happened after, you know, I arrived just before um, Ireland hosted the World Cup in 2017. And it was was amazing. It was my first World Cup that I had been to, played by women. So we did a, a significant review and listened to the coaches and the players about things that needed to be changed, particularly looking at player welfare. So we kind of, the, the tournament is, is quite a bit longer. It's an extra 10 days. And that was because we needed to create more rest days in between in between the periods. We also increased the size of the, the squats so that there was more um, ability for reserves. We introduced a quarterfinal so that we, you know, that that created more of excitement at the back end of the tournament. But also, I mean, one of the changes that we have done um, uh, is that in creating a longer tournament, it does have that kind of knockout ability, whereas up until 217, the woman stayed right through to the end. But now, you know, when you're not in the end, you're not in the end. I guess that's it's not paid for anymore by the host organizing committee. So that's might be some people that stay because they're passionate about rugby, but it's not part of the, the test. So we did a variety of things. Going forward, you know, clearly one of the things with the name change, we're looking at um, really doing much, much more in terms of fan engagement and how we make the the tournament as live aspect because we are in the Southern Hemisphere. It's the first time that the World Cup's been down in the Southern Hemisphere. Well, it will create some um, challenges in terms of UK and Northern Hemisphere pa- passionate fans that might not be able to get down there. So we are investing in in quite a lot more technology in terms of of the at live competition being really, really impressive. Um, So the whole kind of marketing aspect of of it um, that we're working on now. And then, you know, New Zealand, New Zealand does great events. I mean, right now, very, very privileged. And they've got the World Cup in cricket. They've got the World Cup in um, rugby. They've got, they're co-hosting the, the football World Cup. Um, So, you know, it does do events very, very well. And, uh, I know that the the New Zealand Rugby Union is absolutely pulling out all stops to make sure that this is the best World Cup for women so far. And you alluded a little bit in terms of sponsorship and the commercial side of women's sport. And I think while well, Rugby's approached that a little bit differently, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I guess differently in terms of other federations. Yeah, in, in terms of other international federations, and kind of following some of the, the the regional and local federations, particularly in football. I mean, the work that the UA, that UEFA has done and that the FA has done in England um, has been a bit of an inspiration in terms of what we're doing. When we signed off on the strategy, we we um, for global development of women's rugby, it's got five pillars: so it's grow participation, create amazing international competitions, leadership, 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 profile with impact, and the last bit was about diversified investment underpinning the game. And that to me was was really, really important in looking at two aspects. One was growing the percentage of the internal world rugby pie that was invested into women's rugby, but it was also about growing the pie. So it needed to be both. If all we were doing was kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul, then we weren't actually really getting significant gains in terms of standing on our feet saying women's sport is important. So in that work stream, we, we're doing four things. 
we, we developed we developed a separate commercial strategy. We're looking at philanthropy. We're looking at for-purpose funding, and we're looking at capability build. But the commercial stream was the first off the rank, and and we made the call. We did an analysis of what was going on in the unions around the world to see where they were at with their own commercial strategies, and we decided to unbundle the commercial rights for women and men. And by that, what I mean is is that most international federations, as we did, uh, when they sell the rights for their men's World Cup, they also throw in the rights for the women's World Cup and some of the other events as well. That's where we were at. And it's not in saying in any way that the sponsors that were that had been given the women's rights weren't necessarily passionate about women's rugby. But what wasn't happening was the internal cash flow didn't didn't materialize. And also, we weren't sort of seeing the activation to the same extent. And so we decided that women's rugby should, we should be aiming to get a separate commercial program for women's rugby. And we are currently in the market looking for six global partners for women's rugby over the next, for the, over the next six years, sort of picking up this World Cup and the next World Cup and all the other things that we're doing associated with the IP. We went to market um, after the after the World Cup, clearly we have COVID at the moment, so it's been a bit more challenging than we had anticipated. But we're we're we believe that we're doing the right thing, and we're having some interesting conversations with with partners. Everyone's kind of just seeing how things kind of fall out. But I'm I'm very hopeful that within the next three months we might be in a situation to announce something that that could be quite spectacular. Excellent. I get a bit passionate about it as you say but I think it's such an exciting time and for women's rugby because it has so many traits and elements that perhaps other well other men's sport certainly but other women's sport doesn't have to good luck to you we look forward to hearing more thank you we saw some headlines last week that world rugby could ban transgender women over safety issues I just wondered what the process was in terms of a, a timeline for making any decisions like that on a global scale yeah uh... I mean, I guess the first thing to say is that we're in a consultation mode at the moment. I mean, you know, World Rugby doesn't just make calls without consulting its members. And this is an incredibly tricky, tricky and difficult uh, a challenge for any sport to address. I was part of the, the review group. Um, the review group is chaired by a, an amazing um, woman who's one of our executive leadership scholarships or part of our pipeline program called Dr. Ru Chinto, um, who's on the board of Rugby Canada and uh, a, um, a practicing sports psychologist, sports psych, no, sorry, not sports psychologist, psychiatrist, not sport. So she chaired that group. The group was made up of a, a really good mixture of players' representatives, um, our, my, myself, scientists, legal experts that have played. And our task was to review what our current policy was and to decide whether or not it was fit for purpose because there were certain questions that were being raised that were coming to us um, where some of those challenges were being put for us. So, I mean, as with any kind of policy, I mean, it's, it's something that you, you do and you take very seriously. The process that we went through was, A, to make sure that we had a diverse kind of review panel that, that was looking at the issue from all different perspectives. And then we then had a, a, a really insightful two-day forum where a whole series of, of groups that uh, were representative of legal social, ethical, players, medical, came together and we invited um, people to submit papers and discussions on things that we should consider when we were looking at what should we do in terms of creating a fit for purpose. And it, and it kind of pointed out a few things. So, you know, you know, I guess one of the things was, was there was question marks about the policy that the IOC had had in terms of particularly in terms of how it applied for rugby. And, and it would have been professionally inept of us to just pretend that that didn't exist. So, you know, from that perspective, the, the real challenge uh, when you looked at all the research that was put in front of that group was that we are a sport that prides itself in inclusivity, inclusivity and, and diversity and inclusion is really, really important. But we also put player welfare as our number one priority. And there were there were challenges that were coming from, from the wider community about whether or not this was fair. And so I, I think the thing is, is that world rugby is committed to making sure that it remains itself a, an inclusive sport. It may very well be that we need to just think about how that happens in a, in a, in a different way, but there has been no decisions made at, at this stage. And, you know, it's, 
you know, it's kind of interesting. I know that that there has been some absolutely passionate um, women players that have come back and sort of said that, you know, they think this is atrocious that we're looking at this. I think it would be very, like I said, professionally irresponsible for us to not look at it because there has been many, many players who said that we need to. So, you know, it's kind of you're balancing both sides when you're in an international federation. But what I can say is that, you know, it's not a, if we go down that path, it's not a decision that we make lightly. It's a decision that we make in the a full understanding is that you're never going to be popular and that we need to do it with the best information we can and support the widest population that we can. So it's it's something that is um, that we're looking at very, very seriously. And it's out right now with our members for consultation. Fantastic. Thank you. And finally, for you as an individual, Katie, what would you say your personal goals are for the future? Wow, that's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's interesting. COVID's given me a lot of opportunity. Like, it was kind of funny. I, I, I do a family quiz. I'm, I'm, I'm in Ireland by myself. So I, I left my family behind. Well, in saying that, I, I'm, I wasn't married, but my 25-year-old daughter. And everyone laughs because here is the mother, the 55-year-old off on the big girl's adventure. Yeah. And the 25-year-old is back working hard on her career. Abby down in New Zealand. Um, but we do do a family quiz every fortnight. It was my time to do it this time. And uh, and that was one of the kind of questions, that, you know, because you, you sit there and you think about um, what am I doing? I mean, and one of the questions was, what, what was I doing last year versus this year? Last year, I visited 19 countries around the world. You know, it, it was an incredibly amazing year. There was a lot on and it was all about you know, driving the leadership agenda and doing what I could for, for a woman, woman this year, <laughs> it's quite different, you know, safety, safety, safety. I am, um, I am planning on going down to New Zealand uh, in September for an extended stay. I will need to go into quarantine for a period of time. And that is a mixture of work and a little bit of holiday with my, my daughter and my family. But my, my personal goal, I guess I really believe I did a, I, I did an all nighter the other night for a farewell for a, a staff member that I employed who looked after coaching in New Zealand, who was a really special guy. And I, I was thinking about um, my career and, and I sort of said in my leaving speech at two o'clock in the morning, um, so I could be there for, for him, New Zealand time, was that, you know, I think your legacy is the people that you leave behind. And I have been really fortunate to employ some amazing people and see them have some incredible careers doing some amazing things. What I really get a, um, a kick out of is, is developing leaders. And, you know, I'll give you a little story. We have this pipeline program for, you know, when we put 17 women on council, people sort of said, oh, you know, where are the women going to come from? And so I said, oh, well, I'm sure there's lots of women around the world, but let's have some money and we'll develop a pipeline program. We have this executive leadership scholarship program. And, you know, there was a woman for, who was identified who was the president of Burkina Faso, um, Roland Burrow, and she was one of the first women that that I got involved in this scholarship program. Such potential, really amazing lady. She spoke French, not a single piece of um, English, and, and so we had some really interesting conversations initially. She wanted to learn how to, she wanted to participate in the international world of rugby, and she knew that to do that, she needed to master English, and so her scholarship went towards supporting for, for English. You know, here we are three years on. She is on the board of Rugby Africa now. She is a council member on World Rugby. And I remember when she turned up at her first World Rugby Council meeting, she came over to me and she just gave me a hug and she said, thanks, I can speak. And she spoke to me in English. And I just sort of thought, you know, the difference that that has made for that, for that woman who has such potential to actually help drive the change we want to see in Africa. You know, it's, it's so, yeah. So for me, my goal personally is to get more Roland Burroughs and to get more Nahids and to get more Ada Milbys and to to do everything I can to make sure that, that women's voices are heard and that we, that we work with governing bodies around the world to make sure that diversity is respected, recognised and practised. It was lovely to talk to Katie at such an exciting time for women's rugby and I very much look forward to witnessing the impact she'll have on the game in the future. Another big thank you to Sport England for their kind support of the Game Changers, which enables us to share the stories of these amazing women with audiences all over the world. And thanks also to Sam Walker from What Goes On Media, who's our very talented executive producer. If you'd like to find out more about any of the 41 remarkable guests from this and the previous series, please visit our website at fearlesswomen.co.uk. Thanks for all your lovely comments on social media. It's fantastic to hear people are really enjoying the podcasts. Next week, I have the absolute honour 
of talking to Tracy Edwards, MBE, who overcame huge challenges to skipper the first all-female crew in the Whitbread Round the World Yacht Race and was the first woman to receive the Yachtsman of the Year trophy. It is hard to remember 30 years ago how impossible people thought it was for a team of women to sail around the world. People honestly thought we were going to die especially men that didn't sail. To them, it was such a huge thing for even men to sail around the world. How would women be able to do it? And we had extraordinary responses to the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of letters we sent out. One of my favorites was, the thought of 12 of my wife sailing around the world fills me with horror. The Game Changers, fearless women in sport.